Notice if you've been reading through the Psalms uh, this year, how many of them speak of distress, trouble, or adversity. That is, primarily the Psalms are written from the life of David up to really the destruction of Jerusalem. There's a few before my Moses and a few maybe later. But primarily, all those Psalms come in that period where they appear to have a lot of outward success. So David reigned as king, and Solomon reigned as king, but the nation splits. They have a lot of wealth, but they have a lot of trouble. And they have a lot of unrighteousness in their nation. There are a tremendous amount of poor impoverished and oppressed people by the leaders of the nation, whether they be the priests or they be so-called prophets or just the wealthy and powerful. And so the nation has a great deal of adversity and feels a great deal of adversity. And the Psalms, unlike a lot of places in Scripture, really speaks to the emotional trials we go through and the emotional feelings we have as we go through life, trying to please God, trying to do those things that He is happy with, but that we also continue to reach out and need His help to overcome all of the, the difficulties, not only in, in our weakness of our faith at times, but also just the circumstance of our life. Things don't always go the way we would like or the way we might plan. Even when we think we're doing really well faithfully, sometimes things hit us and it just throws us for a loop. And the Psalms speak about this over and over and over again. And so today, I wanted to hit at Psalm 107 primarily and Think about the concept of adversity that is spoken of here. In verse 6, from what's already been read for us in 4 through 9, it says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He talked about wandering, wandering in the desert wastes, finding no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, and their soul fainting within them. All of us, if we are really introspective and honest, will realize we have all been there. Hungry and thirsty, maybe not in a fleshly sense. For most of us, having grown up in America since post World War II, have not faced a tremendous amount of hunger and you know thirst that couldn't be quenched unless we were very, very poor. But lots of people before that felt a lot of that. Both of my parents had long periods of time where growing up in the 30s, you know, as, as children. And so, I've not experienced much of what they did. My mom, in fact, had a pantry that often we had to go through this, this throwaway thing that had not just expired a little bit, but not only expired, but had kind of the cans had blown up and they kind of spilled everywhere because everything was so old. But having grown up in that poverty and that hunger, we really overcooked the food and had lots of extra food all the time. I didn't really get that until I was an adult. I never felt that need as a child, never felt it even as a young adult. But when I understood her better and her situation, her life growing up, you know when you're a kid, 
you don't really care about what you how your parents grew up. You know, you're not that interested. As you're a little older, you actually become more interested in how they grew up and what happened in their life. But I understood that more. I understood that you need to try and have extra food to get the case of that situation where they just didn't have anything to eat. And so, but that's not just physical. When we're talking about being hungry and thirsty in the scriptures, very often we're talking about hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for the Word of God, the thing that actually gives us, you know, sustenance and food that is more important than that of the flesh. And so he speaks to that, and he talks about how he answered them when they cried out in their trouble and in their distress. But what's interesting about this psalm, and if you've already read through it, you might have already known this, he doesn't, this isn't a trouble and a distress that happened to them that he comes in later and fixes. This is mostly a trouble and distress that he brought upon them that they have to cry out about. And so, with the psalm, understanding the concept of adversity, God may not himself cause all of the distress in our lives, but he certainly has made those moments of distress in our lives. And we're going to look at Job in a little bit, just kind of in a general sense. I'm going to turn to the I want to start with this passage in Ecclesiastes 7. Solomon had written, Consider the work of God. Who can make good what he has made crooked? That's kind of a rhetorical question. Nobody can do that, right? If he's made something crooked and he's made something really, you know, winding up the road there, it's like, I, we're not going to come along and straighten it out. It is the way he's made it to be. And so, the statement after that concept is, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. So, understand that God is actually telling you, when things are going well for you, you really ought to rejoice. Don't think, oh, you know, it's like God's not telling you, worry and stress. It's like, you can know that, and you ought to know that. But yeah, difficult times will most likely come after this moment of joy. But that's okay. You can still rejoice in the book. You have the freedom God has given you to rejoice and be happy. So we have a not everybody's happy in the world. Not everybody has everything. You and I don't control everything. You and I don't have power over everything. We don't have a power over all the things, and it's not within our purview to sit and worry and stress about everybody in the world. But he's told us that when our moment of goodness comes, rejoice in it. Be happy about it. Feel blessed. And be glad. But us also, in the day of adversity, now, notice he doesn't say in the name of virtue, feel this. Do so you and I need to be told what to feel when trouble is? Or will you naturally feel bad in some way? Will you naturally grieve? Will you naturally feel sorrow? I don't think we've ever had to tell anybody, oh, that's okay, everything will be fine, and feel, and feel better. We don't have to encourage anybody to, to, to feel bad. We, we encourage people sometimes to feel better, feel good. You don't have to encourage people to feel bad. And everybody is really good at that. From the time they're really, really little. If they don't like what's happening, they let you know that they're not. And human beings have really have no trouble feeling bad in our days of virtue. So he doesn't tell us how to feel. He does tell us what to think about them. He tells us what to consider. When we're having trouble, we need to think. Yeah, we're already going to feel bad, we're going to feel sorrow, we're going to feel grief, but we need to consider something. That God has made the one our moment of good time, but He's also made the other the bad time. And He says, so that man may not find out anything that will happen that will happen after him. And I don't, I tell you, I'm not quite sure what that last part is. I go. You don't really know what's going to come tomorrow. He's given us the good and the bad, and you know what? He's kind of told us the road goes like this. It's kind of like you're driving down a road that's got good and got good and got good and got 
but you don't know and you can't see what's coming up. It's like, why does he want us to not see what's coming next? If we knew what was coming next, would we worry about it too much? Probably. Or what might we, you know, think if, if something good was coming up, what might we dwell on it too much and not get done today what we should do today? Possibly. But he has trying to help us understand that life as we live it will have good days and will have bad days. And he means God has made both of those things true. Now this reminds me of this. When you think about adversity, is anybody in the Bible more connected to the idea of adversity than Job? Can't hardly think of a kid. And there's hardly anybody who goes through as much trouble and adversity as Job does. An entire book set aside to one man's adversity. And Job will be know after his family all died. God, we, and we know the backstory that Satan wants to attack him. But we also know that God allows him. So God had the power to not have that happen to Job. And he allowed it to happen. Now, because understand that God had purpose when he allowed things to happen. He may not have desired to hurt Job. But he knows something good can come from this. Not only for you and I in learning the lesson of Job, but it also for Job himself. Because I suspect Job, by the end of the story, was a far wiser man than he was to begin with. Now, he went through bad days for that reason. Which is true about wisdom, by the way. With wisdom comes grief, but with grief, the outcome can tell the truth. We don't get smarter and wiser without more grief. But grief or wisdom is still better than being ignorant and angry. That's by the way, what Ecclesiastes tells one of the Ecclesiastes tells us about. And so Job, though, his response when everything happens, and all the bad of the party is, you know, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's given and he's taken away. And then when his wife comes to him and says, Listen, you're still paying out how much integrity you have. You should curse God and you should die. And he tells her basically, You foolish woman. Are we going to take the good from God and not take the best? So he, he rebukes her. Like she basically is rebuking him. And he says, Listen, this, God has given us both of these things. And when you think about the concept, and, and usually when we think about Job, we think, of, oh yeah, but God didn't do it to him, Satan did it to him. We always have to remember, God allowed it to happen. God still was in control. And so the statement that Job made, the statement that Ecclesiastes made, or made, is still the same. When adversity comes a part of, God is allowing it. He may not be the root cause of it. He may not be the one kind of trying to make it happen to you, but he is certainly allowing it to happen to you. And, you and so there is something for us to consider about it. And there are lessons I think that we can draw from it and learn from it. And that's what I think of Psalm 107 in many ways is trying to get us to see. Because in Psalm 107, he brings the trouble. I had, actually, I purposely read the little passage that didn't tell you that God brought all the distress and trouble that he's talking about. But in all these other passages, in 10 through 12, some sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in iron, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed or bowed their hearts down with hard labor and fell down with none to help. He did that for them. Verse 17 and 18 says, Some were fools through their sinful ways because of their iniquities, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. In 23 through 27, he says, Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. 
They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and wrapped their wits in. Now notice, this is actually almost the opposite of what Jesus does in the boat with his apostles. When the winds and the waves are scaring them all to death, all these fishermen who've been on boats most of their lives are scared to death they're all going to die in the Sea of Galilee. And he says, tells the wind to stop, and they're like, whoa, we just stop. This is exactly the opposite. God brought up all that wind, wind and storm and sea to make everybody so afraid. Because of their own evil deeds, he says. In 33 to 34, he turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste. Why? Because that's the opposite of what we usually think. Like in the desert, out, when they brought them out of Egypt, he turned that desert into an oasis with water. And then he gave them food. Here it is exactly the opposite. Why? Because of the evil in its inhabitants. He brings upon us trouble and distress. Why? And this is the part that we may cry to Him for help. That we don't rely upon ourselves, that we don't rely upon our leaders, that we don't rely upon that we think the church is going to save us, or our nation is going to save us, or another nation is going to save us. Remember, one of the problems that Judah and Israel had throughout their entire existence prior to their destruction is they kept looking to other nations to save them from a, somebody who was coming and threatening them. And God kept telling them, stop doing that. I am your Savior. I am your help. I am your right hand. I am your sword and your shield. And so over and over again, all through the judges, all through the, the, the divided kingdom, he is the one bringing the trouble. He told them in the law of Moses he would bring the trouble. When they didn't listen, when they didn't follow, when they didn't walk with him. And he did it. He's doing that to help us learn something. Because he could just let us keep going, right? He could kind of overlook it and not give us, you know, discipline and in essence. But he doesn't do that because he loves us. He wants us to learn the lesson. We need him. We need his help. And all the other people and all of the other Institutions in that exist in this life cannot help us with the primary thing that we need God to do. It doesn't matter about how good friends are, how good None of those things are going to save our souls. They can encourage us, they can help us, they can carry burdens when they're too big for us, but they cannot save us. And so God is helping them learn this lesson as well. Because in all four of these verses, he says exactly the same thing. In verse 6, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and delivered them from their distress. 13, they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. 19, they cried to the Lord in their trouble and delivered them from their distress. In 28, they cried to the Lord in their trouble and delivered them from their distress. In fact, doesn't this really sound a lot like the creed of the judges? Over again, it's like he brings trouble, they cry out for help, he saves them. He brings more trouble, they cry out for help, he saves them. Over and over again, for over 400 years, they go through this cycle. And understanding that. We need to learn lessons, sometimes the hard way, because that's human beings. We don't learn just by, how often have you been told something and it didn't really sink in until you kind of went through it and went, oh, now I guess that's a good job. Right? That, that's a pretty common human response. Somebody tells us something and it doesn't matter. I kind of get it, I kind of get it, and then we do it, then we kind of do the thing we shouldn't have done, and they're like, oh, okay, that's it. 
Or we read something. And that, it, we read something that tells us what we should not do, and we, and we kind of we think we did it, and then we, we kind of do it anyway, and then we go, oh, okay, yeah, I did it. I did it. So sometimes we have to just go through those tough times in order to really work. The good and the bad. I talked about earlier when he said, after family or, or loss of all his wealth and things, he said, Naked, I came to my mother's room, naked child, and turned the Lord's name, Lord, and stayed there. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he turned to his wife, and he was still old fashioned, and he cursed God and died. He said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, or shall we not receive evil? And all this, Job did not change his word. It's a lesson to learn. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was kind of going through all the lessons that he really learned from the life of Job. So he loses, he has a lot of children, by the way. And they have family. They're all, they're all essentially out of his house. And in one night, they all die. All of his children, all of his grandchildren, all of his, you know, daughters-in-law, he just said he had seven sons and his daughters. They're all dead. Somebody kind of just tells him they've all been killed. And, and then he learned that all of his wealth, and, and wealth in his time frame was measured by not really land as much as all of your enemies. And he had a massive amount of land. He would have needed probably hundreds of people employed in his household just to manage all of his enemies. He was a wealthy man, one of the wealthiest men in that whole time frame. He might even be one of the people that the ancient Persians um, speak of, a renowned man of wealth and wisdom. It's impossible that Job is actually spoken of outside of the Bible uh, in ancient Persia as well. But Job was a fairly well known man, a wealthy man, a powerful man. In a moment, time loses everything. All of his family, all of his wealth, and then friends come. And we know his friends are not great enough, right? Um, now, at the end, more friends come and family comes later to our help. But initially, his friends don't help him. But some of the lessons that it takes from Job, sometimes it isn't our fault, is it? It wasn't Job's fault. All the adversity that fell upon him was not his fault. We know that in the story. He didn't know that. Now think about this for a second. Was Job ever told he was not at fault for any of that stuff? Was he ever told by God why all of it happened? Was he told that Satan wanted to attack him? No. But he knew it wasn't his fault. He had to keep arguing that over and over and over again. To his friends. He kept saying, he kept trying to argue that it is your fault. It has to be your fault. Sometimes it isn't our fault. But you know, why were his friends, who were also fairly wise men, why were they arguing it was his fault? Because you know what the implication of sometimes it's not our fault it is? Sometimes it is our fault. In fact, which one of those is probably more than 50%? <laughs> probably more our fault than you said not. And though that's kind of what they were working on. Well, this doesn't usually happen to good people. You must have done something. That's kind of potentially their argument. But sometimes the adversity is not something you and I did. That caused it or brought it upon us. But sometimes it is. Sometimes friends and family don't help. You're suffering, you're going through terrible times, and friends come and say, Oh, don't worry about it, just be happy. Sing a song, you know, uh, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, you feel better. You know, when you've really gone through a tough time, you don't really want to listen, don't worry, be happy. Right? But it's, it's not a lot of help in the world. And friends sometimes say those things. They, they say, friends and family too. They, out of all good intentions, and I think Joe's friends had good intentions, they just didn't help. They made it work. They actually 
injured. And they, they, they piled on the suffering that he went through. They didn't intentionally do it, but sometimes that happens. Right? Sometimes we go to digital times and the people close to us do it, they say things or do things, it looks like it happens. So that is the whole point. Why we need to cry for God? And understand that sometimes only God can help. Sometimes nothing else will satisfy, and nothing else will help. Right? Is there any other help Job could have gotten other than from God? God showing up and talking to him. Now, the one good, really great help that he received from God, he didn't, God did not tell him, and, it, and God did not explain to him everything and why it happened. But he did tell him, essentially, after, after getting him to essentially close his mouth, <laughs> he did, to implication, who was the good guy in all of that? Job was, because his three friends knew Job to Pray for them and offer sacrifices for them. So God would accept them. He's like, okay, you guys, <laughs> Job, I, you know, he wasn't terribly pleased with some of the things Job was saying, but he was really unhappy with the three Christians. And he's like, you guys, you guys need to help. And Job helped him. This, this, think about that. These three wealthy guys, his friends, come to this poor, he's now a poor man, right? Who has nothing? Who is his physical flesh would have looked disgusting. Because remember, he was full of boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his soul, and he scraped them all open with with powder. So I don't know how long it would take for that mess to not look like a mess. But I suspect he probably had some of those scars. And so he didn't look good, he didn't have any money, and um, they were they, they were attacking him, and God said, You need his help to be forgiven. So God helped him, even though he didn't tell him everything about it. And God was really the only one that could help him. Because Job himself was at a loss for why it had happened. And here's a, one of the last other things. I have two more, but sometimes people go wrong. Right? You go through a tough time, and you, we'd always like to have, just like, oh, I learned my lesson this time. And sometimes there's really a great lesson to learn. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. I've had a couple of those in my life. So I never repeat it. Learn the hard way. Well, I'm not going to do that again. But sometimes you're like, I don't know what to I don't know what to do I don't know what to do with it. I don't know why it happened. Isn't that the way Job was left? Did Job really know why it all happened? God didn't tell him. All God did is kind of say, hey, you wanted to have a, an argument with me? You wanted to debate me and, and over all this? Okay, let's debate. You tell me. He's like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to shut up and not say anything and make it work. And so God asked him all these questions that Job has no idea to. And in the end, he just realizes, I just got to trust God to trust God. Sometimes all I can do is trust God. Even when I don't understand why. Why it's going to happen. Now, I want to look at, and these James talks about Job, that the purpose of that distress and adversity and trials and tribulations, they have purpose. There's a reason God made us not only have the good days but the bad days. Because God has purpose. It does. He says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So what was the purpose of the Lord with Job? 
say, wow, I guess we're going to take it lower. We know from this backstory with Satan, what did Joe, what did God do to answer Satan's initial statement? He does this because you help him. If you didn't help him, he wouldn't be taken. But God said, Satan, I told you so. That a faithful man, even when I'm not giving him everything and taking care of everything, will still be faithful. But he also did something else with Job. And in the end, Job received twice as much. So twice as much is actually pretty interesting. Because the end will be greater than the beginning. That's one of the great lessons of the book of Job. But it's not just in Job, it's actually in Isaiah as well. In fact, both places, exactly twice as much. Why is that at all interesting? Well, let, me, let me just read uh, one passage here. Job 42. A passage that we might remember to some degree. But 10 through 12, at the very end uh, of the book, it talks about restoring the fortunes of Job. When he had prayed for his friends, it's talking about Job. Job had prayed for his friends. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, that's a statement. The next few verses actually explain how God did that. He says, Then came to him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and they bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money, and they ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 feet, 6,000 tables, 1,000. And you go through those numbers, and at the very beginning of the story, we're told the numbers of the Jewish twice a year. But the two times as many is actually somewhat as if there's a, a meaning to it. Isaiah 61 also talks about it. And you, if you, you might remember, what is Isaiah 61? If you were to say, What's in Isaiah 61? At the beginning of that verse, ideally, as Christians, you could remember that Isaiah 61 is really impactful because it's the verses that Jesus spoke about himself when he announced he was going to die. He did that in a hometown, pulled this ass for the coal, soul of Isaiah, rolled to this part. At that time, by the way, they didn't have verses in chapter one. So he got to this place in the, in the scroll of Isaiah, and he began to read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearts, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give their people headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. So he reads the beginning of that, and he, he, he starts, stops really at the beginning of the two, but he says after he reads, he says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, everybody sitting in that synagogue that day we're probably not shocked that some, it's a Jewish man, and he's got a guy who's teaching and grabbing Isaiah 61 and talking about this promise of God, but they probably were completely, I should probably take away probably, they were not expecting him to say, that's it. By the way, the way you, you're, you're Joseph's son, you're your carpenter's kid, like, who are you? Because at this point, he hasn't really done anything. This is what he says right at the beginning. He announces it to them. That this, what God spoke of, this promise has been fulfilled. Now, he just says a little bit at the beginning of that sentence, but it goes all the way down into verse 7. So this is what he's being talked about. So when he read that, do you think he meant them to say, well, it's only to this part that I'm fulfilled? No, I, I think the reading is, he only gave you a little part, but he goes, I'm fulfilling all of this promise that Isaiah 61 is talking about. And in verse 7, it says, Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their life. 
Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. This is double portion. That's what the twice as much is actually significant. What is twice as much? Mm-hmm. So you think about the law of Moses. You think about the inheritance. Well, who got the double portion? Is that kind of the eldest son? He got a double portion. Because his job was not only to have his own portion, but he got another portion to provide for his mother and father as they got into He was, right? And so Jesus is that firstborn son, right? But we are the church of the firstborn as well. Which is why we all receive a double portion as well. And by the concept of being at the end being greater than the beginning. Why, what God is going to give us to fulfill His promises is more than you and I have ever even begun to imagine. We are promised that double portion. We are given that by our Lord, our Savior, who gave His life so we can have this fulfilled in us. And that's what He's telling us, a blessing. The adversity. None of us like the adversity. None of us like the trouble. And I know a lot of people are going through it right now. And I didn't, I didn't purposely choose these lessons for us right now, but I think it fits pretty well. I just chose to go through the wisdom literature this year and decided to preach from it every week. And that's what keeps coming up right now. Now, I don't know if that's helping everybody or not, but I know lots of people are going through it. A lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are suffering. A lot of different ways. And I hope that to some degree you understand that God knows and it has come. And it isn't it isn't like he doesn't care. And it isn't like it has no end or no purpose to it. Now it doesn't always make it easy, right? It still makes it tough. But hopefully we can do what you said in Ecclesiastes and six four. And yet he pointed to these tough days just like he pointed to good days. And if we know that, we can also understand that he's appointed a great day. When we will put off this flesh and we can put away these days of adversity that we live upon in this world and look forward to that. 